Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to our worship service. Great to have all of you. Uh, if you would, just take a couple seconds. Probably been doing this already, but uh, greet each other quickly before we begin, if you would. All right, all right. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, everybody. Um, please sign the friendship registers. They're uh, the end of the aisles or in the pew, not pews, but chairs. Please sign those during the course of the service. Uh, today we're going to talk about Samson a little bit. Uh, we have focused in these uh, months during summer on the sanctified Christian life. I talk about how Samson fits into that today. Um, just so you know, as we watch the kids filter in, uh, they're going to be singing first, and then we're going to join in the opening hymn. That's on page four of your service folder. Father, we praise you. And uh, the rest of the service course printed out for you in your service folder. So when the kids are ready, they will begin. Bye. 
stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by His death on the cross and freed us from death by His resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts, for without your help we are unable to please you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson for this morning is recorded for us in Ezekiel chapter 18. In our lessons today, you're going to hear about what genuine faith does. Not just words, but faith that changes lives. In this lesson from Ezekiel 18, it begins with a, a proverb that the people were saying. The point of the proverb was, you're punishing us for things our parents did. You're not fair, God. And then God explains, no, I'm fair. I'm so fair that I, I, I love you in spite of your sins. I, it's, I'm looking at what you do, not at what your parents do. And in, in reminding them of that, he reminds us that genuine faith, first of all, sees our own failures, doesn't make excuses, doesn't blame, but confesses to God our failures. And then genuine faith sees God for who he really is. He is a God who forgives, who eagerly wants to forgive his people. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you, Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them. That person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own, your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. The word of the Lord. We'll join together in singing the psalm, Psalm 25.
hear the Word of God from Philippians chapter 2. At the beginning, you'll hear the Apostle Paul inspired to write about the, the virtues that God wants to be in us, the attitudes and the thoughts he wants us to have. But this does not happen in a vacuum. Be good. Be nice. This happens because we see what Jesus Christ has done at the end of the lesson. He spends more time talking about Jesus than he does talking about us. At the end of the lesson, he reminds us all that Christ has done. That's what enables us. Jesus Christ has set us free from sin so that these attitudes of kindness and compassion can now live in us. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. stand for the gospel lesson. This morning we hear the gospel lesson of our Lord from Matthew chapter 1 beginning at verse 23. You'll hear a dialogue between Jesus and his, his opponents, his enemies here, and Jesus helps us to see what real faith is. Real faith is that we live our faith, that we trust in our God. It's not just empty words that we say and then nothing happens, but it is a faith that looks to God and truly believes that he is who he says he is, a God who saves his people. Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By, by what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why don't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said, to, said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they replied. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord 
Please be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn, hymn number 850. Grace, mercy, peace are all yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's Word that we're considering today is from Judges 16, beginning at the 21st verse. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. This is the word of our God. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, fellow redeemed, when I was, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I used to read a lot of comic books. And one of those comic books, one of the guy's name was Iron Fist. Iron Fist. 
That kind of dates me. I don't know if you know of Iron Fist. Well, anyway, I was uh, the other day looking up, because I kept some of these comic books, and I thought, I wonder what these are worth. So I looked up this Iron Fist comic book, and I think it was like good condition, okay, good condition, like 250 bucks, jackpot, right? So I toddled down to the basement where you should really not keep comic books to begin with, but anyway, in a box, I rummaged through all this stuff, and there I found that particular comic book, Iron Fist. And as I took it out of the box, the cover was off of it. Pages were missing. It looked like the mice had got in there and were eating it. And I realized that $250, nope, maybe 75 cents, right? As I thought about the story of Samson, I thought about superheroes like Iron Fist. Maybe you've got a favorite of your own, Black Panther, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. Today, we're going to meet up again with a real live superhero. You know, kids, as much as I loved Iron Fist back in the day and the Incredible Hulk and all of those other superheroes, I realize that they... They're not real. They're fun. Fun to go see the movies. But today, we're introduced to a real, live superhero by the name of Samson, a man who lived 3,000 years ago in a region that we know, now know as the Gaza Strip. God, in his infinite wisdom and grace, had given Samson superhuman strength. The Philistines... We're living in the Gaza Strip, and they were just horrible people. They lived immoral lives. They hated the God of Israel. They hated the people of Israel. They were always trying to, to wipe out the people of Israel. And God had had enough. He sent one judge after another. One of them was Samson. And he says, I'm going to punish those Philistines for their wickedness, and I'm going to use Samson to do it. And you remember, Samson had that long hair, which he was never to cut. And God tied that superhuman strength to the length of Samson's hair. As long as Samson trusted in the Lord and followed the Lord's will and ways and never cut that hair, he would have that superhuman strength. So what kinds of things did Samson do? You remember how that lion once attacked Samson. Those of you who know, you know that, that lions can be up to nine feet long and weigh up to like 400 pounds. So if that lion was just half that size, any normal human being would have been torn to shreds. But Samson, you remember the story, Samson takes that lion and he kills that lion. Another feat of strength that the Bible records for us, Samson once took the jawbone of a donkey. You remember that? Wiped out a thousand Philistine troops, soldiers. Think about that, a thousand troops just with the jawbone of a donkey. Still another account tells us that Samson, in order to evade capture in one of the Philistine cities, he takes the whole city gate made of, I don't know, iron or bronze. He lifts it up off of his foundation, puts it on his shoulders, and jogs with it like 38 miles away, plops it down. And you ask yourself today, how did Samson get to the point where we see him in our text? The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. How does a guy who literally had it all lose it all? How does a man with superhuman strength get to the point where he's like a mule or a horse? You remember those big millstones in the Bible? They'd be round, the circular stones, 
one on top of the other. They would put grain in between those two stones and they would grind the grain. That's what Samson was doing without eyes, without strength anymore, going round and round in that mill of misery. How does it happen? Well, that's the main story, isn't it? I think in the story of Samson, there were certain blind spots in Samson's life that led to his downfall that we want to just touch upon a little bit this morning. The first reason that Samson ended up with his eyes poked out in that mill of misery is because he disobeyed his parents. You kids here today, you still listening? Samson disobeyed his parents. Samson had godly parents. They loved the Lord. They loved Samson. They brought Samson up in the ways and will of the Lord. And they said, Samson, whatever you do, do not pick a wife from those godless Philistines. That woman, any woman from the godless Philistines, they're going to lead you astray. And Samson took that advice and totally blew it off. He took the fourth commandment, which says you ought to obey your parents. You ought to listen to them and respect them and honor them. And he totally trashed the fourth commandment. Samson lost his eyes. One of the reasons was he disobeyed his parents. Second weakness that Samson had is he loved the ladies, except he loved the wrong kind of ladies. Samson was what we would call a hedonist today, someone who's only interested in their own pleasure. And even though his parents had begged him, that's all he did. He went to the Philistine women and he dabbled with their affections. He showed interest in them. He did other sinful things with them. Samson lost sight of the Lord because he was so focused on his own pleasure. And the final thing that led to Samson getting his eyes gouged out was the fact that he was full of himself. Even though God had given Samson all of these gifts, it was the Lord who had given him strength, the Lord who had blessed him. Samson gets a big head, and he starts to think, you know, it's all about me. I'm the one who's doing all of these things, and he forgot that he needed the Lord's blessing, and he needed the Lord's guidance and his grace. So why do you think this story is written for us in the Bible? What am I supposed to get out of the story of Samson? The first point I think that has to be made here, and you know, when it comes to children in the home, kids, kids, are you listening? One of the sins that is pointed out here is Samson's disobedience to his parents. You know, children, if we ever get to the point and we're, if we're in the home, we're with mom and dad, and we think that we can disobey our parents, if we think that we can take the advice that our parents give as we're living them, with them in that home, if we think that we can take that advice that they give to us and just throw it away. We just don't listen to it. That's a mistake, isn't it? God, in his grace, kids, has given you your parents to build you up, to strengthen you in the Lord, to teach you and to train you, to, to tell you, hey, avoid this. If we disobey those parents, we run the risk, don't we, of ending up like Samson, away from the Lord? Another thing I think we can glean from this lesson is it's a mistake for us, all of us, to just kind of dabble with sin, right? 
To think that we can start abusing drugs or abusing our family members or, or, or abusing alcohol without any harm. But the Bible says, you know, your sin will seek you out, right? We're fooling ourselves if we, if we think that we can just take the Lord's will and his ways and shove that out of our life. Another point is this. Samson ended up in that mill with, uh, without his eyes because slowly but surely he slipped away from the one true faith. You know, it didn't happen all at once. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it can happen to us, right? Samson, he gets captured. Delilah, remember, cuts off his hair. He allows it, and then he wakes up, and he says, he thinks to himself, I can get out of these shackles, no problem. I'm a superhuman. I got this strength. But the Bible tells us he did not realize the Lord had left him. And that can happen to any of us. Where we become lackadaisical in our prayer life and in our worship life, and slowly but surely we drift away from the Lord. That's the warning, isn't it? But do you know why this is one of the favorite Bible stories of all time? Because the best part's yet to come. There he was. Samson was in that mill of misery. His eyes are gone. He's going round and round like a mule. But then he realizes in repentance, it's my sins that have led me to this point. And he remembers the good news of the Savior that his parents had told him about when he was still on their knees as a young boy. And in repentance and faith and trust, he goes to the Lord in prayer and he says, Lord, help me. Remember me. And the Lord in his grace hears Samson and he answers that prayer and the Lord returns Samson's strength to him and that's this verse but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved and right after this God gave Samson the greatest victory remember he pushes the columns down wipes out all those Philistines, and he killed more Philistines that day than he had in his entire life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is such a great story because it reminds us that our God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and more. How many of us here sitting right now feel that we have just worn out God's welcome? How many times will God continue to answer my prayers when I go to him in repentance time and time again, but I keep slipping into that same sin time and time again? Isn't the Lord sick of me? And this account says, no, our God is a God of grace and love and mercy no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've done it, no matter how many times you have tried and failed and tried and failed, God always, always welcomes you back. The nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, those hands, they're always open, ready to receive you home. You know, sometimes we think God can't possibly forgive me. Look at Samson. The things that Samson did, and yet God gives him his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. And he used Samson in his kingdom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter how sketchy your past is, so how many, uh, it doesn't matter how many tears you've shed on your pillow because of the sins you've committed. God forgives you. He loves you. He cares about you. He restores you. He redeems you. 
and he can and will still use you in his kingdom. Let's rejoice in that, shall we? Let's thank God for that. And with his help, let's continue to live for him just like Samson ultimately did at the end. May God give us strength to do that. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Confession of Faith today, the Nicene Creed, page 13, we join together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Receive these offerings and use them for the good of your holy church. Make us all willing to give our entire lives to serving you, for you alone have saved us. You alone are the Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we will speak two special prayers, one on behalf of Marilyn Bond and then another one for uh, Belinda Dirks, both of whom will be undergoing some medical procedures this week. We pray. Merciful Lord, you founded your church upon the proclamation of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Purify our hearts and minds as we hear your holy word. May we know and believe that your grace is for us, and may we respond with newness of heart that is a reflection of your perfect love. Merciful Lord, encourage us by your Holy Spirit that we may not lose heart as we live in a sinful world and as we face many trials, both as individuals or as a congregation. Make us to be one of mind and will, sharing a unity of faith and a love for one another. Open our eyes to the gifts you have given to us so that each of us may serve you in our lives according to these gifts and talents that you have graciously offered to us. Merciful Lord, sustain all fathers, mothers, and children, husbands and wives, friends and neighbors, workers and employers, teachers and students. Enable us all to serve our neighbor in godly vocations, delighting in the Lord's loving kindness for us. Merciful Lord, all the might of man is nothing before you, yet you have appointed earthly rulers 
to punish evil and to honor good. Give us faithful leaders who will serve honorably and well according to your will. Bless those who serve in the armed forces so that they may continue to defend us and protect our liberty. Merciful Lord, grant the encouragement of Christ and the comfort of his love to all those who suffer any kind of trouble. Especially today, we pray for Marilyn and Belinda that you would be, the, be with them in the coming days as they undergo medical procedures. In every affliction, Lord, prove yourself a ready and worthy Savior as we again and again see how you save and bless your people. Merciful Lord, in you there is no change, only endless love and grace. Kindle your divine light in us that we may stand united as Christ's own body, holding fast to the word of light and shining brightly in the midst of this world's darkness. All these things we ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We'll continue with the next hymn. That's hymn number 900, Lift High the Cross. for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, 
that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. It's hymn number 929. Good morning again. Uh, oh, before the announcements, there's, uh, welcome if you're visiting with us. We are very glad that you're here. I hope you took a, time, a moment to sign the uh, friendship registers and that you'll be able to join us again soon. But delighted that you could worship with us this morning. The purple insert in your worship folder has the announcements for the week. There's a number of them. Please read them, but I got to lean on one. A month from now will be the, the Wells National Choir Festival at uh, Wisconsin Lutheran College. We've been asked to host some of the kids who will be coming from high schools from around the country. And we still need about eight places for about 18 kids who've been assigned to us. By the back, by the water, by Pastor Zarling, there's a, there's a tripod. It has the info if you would like to sign up. It would be wonderfully helpful. They're really great kids. They sing in the choir in their schools. They're very nice, respectful. They won't cause any problems. So if you could please host some of them, uh, take a look there. You'll get a little bit more information. You can sign up there if you're able to do that. The other announcement in the uh, worship folder, I would, or the insert, I should say, there's a white insert. 
Uh, on the front, it's got some useful information. It's good. Read that. But on the inside, it's got pictures. These are pictures of what we've got from our uh, architects so far. These are just the renderings. This is not the final plan. But just wanted to get that in front of you so you could see some of the things that, that we're seeing. And we'll be talking about this as a group in the next couple weeks. But wanted to get this in front of you so you could see what, what they're proposing that they would do, first of all, in this space, turn this into a, a sanctuary. The good news I thought of during this service is the, the plan says they could seat 400 people in here, which if you ushered today, you'd be really happy to hear that because they had to haul in a bunch of chairs because we didn't have enough room. So it would be a bigger, not bigger space, but more seating would be available in here. Uh, on the far end of the building, you don't see pictures of this, but there'd be a fellowship hall in some of the old classrooms on that end, and then in between there'd be an office suite with some offices for pastors and other people there. That's the proposal as we've got it right now, so just take a look at it. This is something for you to, to consider and think about. Uh, oh, and then finally, it's noted on there, don't get hung up on the details in those pictures, like the colors or the fixtures. They just put those in the renderings to make it look nicer. We have not talked at all about any of that kind of stuff. So ignore that and just be kind of big picture right now as you look at those pictures. That's all we're, we're trying to look at. With that, I think that's everything. So God's blessings to you this week.